My mind now turns to the 18th of August 2023 when we commemorate the 50 years of time that has elapsed since uh, the, the government decided enough was enough and we were leaving Vietnam. So I came from an army family and the suburb in which I grew up, Paddington in Sydney, was full of returned service men and women. So I thought of all kinds of things at school uh, that I might do when I finished up in school, but I suppose always in the back of my mind was the honourable nature of serving Australia in the uniform of the Navy, Army or Air Force. So uh, I suppose it was a bit natural in the end that I ended up saying, I'll give the Army a go. And my dad said to me, uh, by all means, if that's what you really want to do, but have a crack at being an officer. And that's what I did. So when I left school and I was accepted into the military, I went to the famous and fabled Duntran, the Royal Military College of Australia. For Australia, Duntoon has become the equivalent of Sandhurst and West Point. In addition to the study of the arts, economics, mathematics, science and engineering, the course for the Duntoon cadet embraces every aspect of military training. During his four years at Set up uh, in 1911 and now had almost mythical uh, nature in the army as uh, an officer factory. And it was tough. Uh, it was much tougher than I had thought. It was overwhelming in its uh, uh, the sort of requirement to be inculcated into the ethos of the army. The people there were incredibly experienced and very demanding. And you find, found out later on the reason was, of course, you're going to be entrusted with the lives of the men and women of Australia, the most precious commodity of all. Back in 1965, when I went into the Royal Military College, uh, Australia, at least its armed forces, had been on non-stop warlike operations uh, virtually since a few years after World War II. We knew, as young officers, we were heading into an army that, by and large, was still involved uh, in conflicts in our region. You know, uh, it's understandable, I think, to say that every one of those young men of whom I was proudly a part at, in Duntroon in the, in the 60s, were all of us breaking our necks to get away on operational service. That's a euphemism for going to war. And the reason was, is that was, that's the life we'd chosen, was to be part of the armed forces of Australia. So naturally, you wanted to test yourself out. Now, I look back at my age now, I think, well, that was a fairly immature attitude, but understandable. Well, we did graduate at the end of 1968, and a lot of us soon found ourselves in Vietnam. is Vietnam, just three quarters the size of Victoria, home for 15 million people. A conflict which had gone from small, a small commitment in 1962, you know, 70 or 80 of our uh, men who were uh, advising and training the Vietnamese, to thousands deployed uh, as the years went by to a major military commitment we had if in, in what we term today a brigade's worth of infantry and all of the supporting arms were uh, present in Vietnam and we, many of us, disappeared into that great group and got on with the, the arduous nature of jungle warfare uh, in Vietnam. Where the vegetation, the, the terrain is so constricted that it requires enormous skill. One of those, the main one, is self-discipline. Self-discipline in the jungle means that you become almost um, uh, silent in the nature of your your day-to-day -day, uh, operations. You talk in a whisper. You sneak around. You don't blunder. Any unnecessary noise will transmit itself out of your sight and possibly into the ears, into the hearing of your adversary. 
So you, you tend to work in a way which is almost totally silent. Until combat, and then the silence becomes an overwhel overwhelming cacophony of, of sound. Explosions, small arms, people shouting, uh, and you go from this silence to this just paralysis of noise. Uh, and you go from apprehension to the realization of mortal danger. As people slug it out, where the, the, the sounds of combat echo underneath the canopy of the trees, in the case of Montan, in the rubber plantation, in actual jungle, uh, under the canopy of the tall timber, to roll and resonate and reverberate. Uh, and uh, it, while it's deafening, it's also got this uh, eerie quality to it, where a single shot can sound either uh, muffled or often will roll and reverberate. Uh, and one of the things as a young infantry commander that's been through combat, at the end of the passage of battle, you find yourself hoarse. You've been saving up your voice for days, often weeks at a time, whispering one to another. And suddenly, after an episode of combat, you are hoarse. You have been shouting your voice off to get your orders through, passing information one to the other. And uh, it's, it's just an irony of the medium of combat. I went on to a very long career after Vietnam. But everything I did rested upon that experience. And I always enjoyed uh, the opportunity to further be responsible for Australian men and women in uniform as I got more senior. And the important part about that was it all rested back on the Vietnam era, but you understand the responsibility you bear. of the 1st Battalion Royal Australian Regiment arrived back from Vietnam. On the 50th anniversary, we look back at the entire experience, back to 1962 when our commitment started with the training team and all the years then until uh, January the 11th, uh, 1973, when uh, the Whitman government through the Governor-General uh, proclaimed that this was the end of our combat operations. So that's a long passage of time. In that time, uh, it became obvious that uh, with a fairly significant section of the Australian people, the Vietnam War was unpopular. And uh, that gave the government, of course, the license to say, well, we'll, we'll, we'll cease combat operations here, we'll, we'll withdraw. Um, so that's all perfectly legitimate, but the demonstrations and the, and the uh, abuse from time to time heaped upon the men and women who'd been off uh, in a legitimate, and a wholehearted way to support uh, their nation, wearing their uniform, taking dangers, seeing their comrades die. Um, uh, this was most unfortunate. And I think since that time, the, my observation would be from a different perspective now, is that uh, our population is a lot more mature. And uh, they are able to say, well, perhaps we disagree with a military deployment, but we're not going to visit that upon the people who in their uh, genuine commitment to Australia, uh, serving their nation. It's a, it's a sort of a, a footnote to the history of the Vietnam War. It doesn't dominate in any way our memories of the 11 years or so when our men and women, 60,000, went off to that war over time. 523, we note, were killed directly, any number of whom afterwards uh, of the 60,000 are still suffering some of the after effects and about 35,000 or so remain alive today. I like to look back year on year uh, to uh, the way in which Australia's Defence Force has continued to be a wonderful servant of the nation. Uh, has itself again shown itself to be a, an instrument of the government uh, an institution revered by ordinary Australians, deeply respected 
by uh, many other nations which see Australia as being a shining light of democracy and the ability and the willingness to defend the helpless wherever they are around the globe. So Australia stands for something. Our military uh, stands for something within the uh, eyes of Australians. And I like to think that the, the ghosts of the 60,000, uh, those who've passed and those who are now elderly in their, in their Australian lives uh, also stand for something. I like to think that on the 18th of August, Australians will pause and say, thank you.